No matter who you are, your profession, education or family, one thing is certain. Life will throw many challenges and lessons at you. So how do you prepare for one of the most challenging of them all? Separation. Welcome to Fortified Lessons on Love and Divorce. I am your host, Letitia Braving. I'm honoured to be facilitating this series with Lisa Toomey, Director of Toomey Family Law, based here on the stunning Sunshine Coast. Throughout this interview series, we will speak with some of the most inspiring and high profile athletes and entrepreneurs about love, life and the lessons from their divorce. This isn't as sad and depressing as you may think. No, this series is really aimed at helping others be as emotionally and mentally prepared as possible as they embark on the journey of separation and divorce. So join Lisa Toomey and myself as we dive into the raw, sad and funny realities of divorce and how we can all do it better if the time comes. Lisa, welcome to our cosy little couch setup. Always a pleasure, Letitia. Now, I think we'll start with the most obvious one. What was the inspiration behind this series, Fortified Lessons on Love and Divorce? So I think what it really came down to is after speaking with my clients and um, they giving me a really clear indication of how they felt going through the process, they had some really valid comments to make. And I, and I thought, well, you know, these are people who are well-respected in the community. Um, if this is how they have felt... And let's face it, it's a very levelling experience. Then I figured that what what they had gone through um, might benefit some other people uh, who are going through the same thing so that people realise that it's not just them. Yeah. And I think the name of this series, Fortified, um, you know, if we think about that fortification process, it's stressing something and, and then improving it. And, you know, one of the really beautiful things about the people we've chosen for this interview is that they talk about how the process actually did help them strengthen and become better people, which, you know, <laughs> many people will be going, what? That doesn't sound like it could be so. But do you think there are some common denominators around what, um, for people not having a good divorce? You know, what what does it take to have a bad divorce? Um, well, we, we speak a lot about communication and I think that's uh, probably one of the key issues. It's a lack of communication and whether that be communication between the parties or communication between the lawyers, um, it really comes down to, uh, I, I think that's an element of one of the problems with a bad divorce, that there's just, there's not a lot of focus. There's... What normally happens is that people kind of polarise. So they go into their, their fighting corners, as you will, and they they just don't want to come out um, because that's where they are, that's where they think they need to be. And I think people need to understand that they need to um, loosen up, really, about uh, the process and, and loosen up about what the direction they want to take and then and actually come out of your corners and start talking. That's a really helpful um, analogy that I can use. And when I say coming out of the corners, I mean using using facilities like mediation or arbitration to try and resolve their matters rather than heading off through a very lengthy, ugly call process. Mm. It probably doesn't help that we've got a lot of representations of what divorce and separation is like on TV, where you've got that, you know, the angry bulldog lawyer really inciting a fight. Um, do you think, you know the way we practice law has to change or do we need to let go of any, any of those preconceived ideas? You're spot on about that. The way in which we practice law needs to be more of a focus to change the way in which people come through the experience. So um, I, I like to think that lawyers are motivated to help their clients through the process. And if they're motivated to do that, then sometimes the process can be fairly slipstream. It's it, it really comes down to a lot of elements, and that is a motivated client to settle and also a, a motivated lawyer to, to move the thing along. So if you don't have those elements in your process, then you're going to have problems. Um, luckily, though, as an absolute backstop, we have the Family Court because so, – and, and, in fact, I should say the Federal um, Circuit Court and Family Court of Australia, now that it's known as um, – that – that allows us to use that backstop to try and move things along if we are blocked at a, a stage where we where we just can't move it along between ourselves. I feel like 
there are certain things being implemented um, to, I guess, change the way family law is being practiced. But traditionally, I think, um, and rightly so, there has been a stigma around family lawyers in citing a fight. Um, you know, do you think family law practices from when you started 20, oh gosh, odd years yeah, ago? Yeah, yeah, plus, plus, <laughs> keep going, the big hind. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you see a big difference in how you were, I guess, trained and taught versus what some young graduates are being taught at university these days? Um, I can only comment in relation to the young lawyers that I see coming through. And I, I think the important thing is there, there's a lot to be said about technology and what I I feel young lawyers are losing the grasp of is actually picking up a phone and talking to the lawyer on the other side um, and seeing if you can reach some common ground in relation to a matter and trying to set a pathway to try and resolve matters. It's easy for me because, uh, you know, because of how long I've been in the profession and and the fact that I I know my colleagues, um, I can pick up a phone and I can have a decent chat without um, fear of, uh, you know, overstepping the mark or putting my client in a position that I may prejudice them in some some way because I had that level of confidence and experience. It's young lawyers who don't have that level of confidence and experience, I think, um, is causing some issue about matters being resolved and, and all they need to do because old war horses like me are really happy to actually have a chat you know and and talk about how we can resolve matters um so i think that if if uh the younger profession can um you know uh, be a bit more steel about uh you know uh, phoning and and being more communicative through a um a process as like telephone and mediation and, um, uh, you know, other, other mediums rather than just sending emails, uh, then I think that might help. I think that might help quite a bit. And do you think universities and the courses that are being offered for these young people need to address, you know, a more holistic approach, not only with communication, but how they're dealing with their matters of, of their clients? Um, I, th- I think universities probably these days and and I can only speak from what my young lawyers tell me who are studying um, and I glean from them what what may be happening in that space uh, I think a more practical apo- approach would be very helpful young students and um, young lawyers coming through that process I think would really help if they um, had more uh, practical experience in the field. And, and I, I do know that universities are very much now focused on that because I, I understand now there are actual subjects where um, they can go out into the field and they actually get uh, uh, credits for working in law firms. And I think that's absolutely essential. So You can't replace real world experience. I mean, you, one of the things that you were sharing with me is how you got into family law and, you know, that's a... Uh, you have been in the field for a very long time um, and you shared with me your experience how it was sink or swim for you, you know. Yeah. So can you share how you got into family law? Yeah, um, well, it really just came down to the fact that I was working under a um, family law partner and uh, that's what she did day in, day out and that's what I assisted her with and it was a very um, interesting process because because she was so busy, it really was a situation where I had to work it out for myself. But I was very lucky. I had a really good mentor um, in a barrister uh, called Gary Fleetwood. And we had um, – and he kind of took me under his wing as a young lawyer. And he was tremendous experience for me, you know. And having that connection with someone who's in the courts all the time um, is absolutely essential because if you can pick up that phone and, and make that phone call and say, hey, I've got this matter and this is what's happening. What do you think I should do now? Um, and they're more than happy to assist. I think that's absolutely critical to the growth of your career and the growth of understanding about what you're doing. And, and I'm certainly not suggesting that the um, the partner who I worked under was not um, helpful at all, but but being busy in a busy practice, so and this happens in this day and age, um, you know, senior practitioners sometimes don't have time to be able to, you know, uh, you know, provide that level of knowledge and assistance to their younger practitioners because senior practitioners have a lot of pressure on them. They have to bill, they have to bring clients in the door, they have to market, they have to please their, you know, the people who they're working for. So there's a there's a lot of there's a lot um, you have to you there's a lot of um, elements you 
you have to be than just a family law practitioner when you're working in a legal practice. Yeah, for sure. And mentors are so important to all young people, all, all people. I mean, you were talking about the barrister. Um, do you remember one bit of advice that he gave you that sort of changed the way you saw or practiced law? Gary was always giving advice. I mean, trust me, oh, you know, <laughs> which is what I loved about him. Um, but there was one particular incident that I had before a very well-known family court judge, and his name was um, Judge Warnock, Bernie Warnock, and he was a very, very popular judge, very considerate, very polite, and he was just a pleasure to appear before, and I was a very, very young practitioner. And uh, what happened was I had a matter before him, and the, um, the other side, they had briefed a very senior barrister, and honestly, it was the most um, terrifying, one of the most terrifying experiences of my life because it was just me with this counsel on the other side and he was um, going to town about my client and he was, it was like he was, you know, in a TV soap drama. It was just out of control and I thought to myself, what am I going to do? Here, here I am, how am I going to um, be able to, you know, express to this judge what my client's case is after listening to all of that? Do I have to get up and do I have to shout and scream and do I have to wave my arms around? what am I going to do? Anyway, um, so this particular barrister sits down and um, I stand up and Judge Warnick, he puts his hand up and he says to me, and he must have seen how terrified I was, and he puts his hand up and he says, you know what, you don't ha all you've got to do is make a good case. And with that, and, and he, he, you know, gave a very sly look to the counsel on the other side as if to say, you know, you just... Honestly, you're, you're, you made a mockery of this. Um, and that, that really settled me. And I thought, you know what, I've got a good case. And all I've got to do is make a good case. And I don't need to yell and I don't need to scream. So um, I've kind of I've taken that on board through my career. All I've got to do is make a good case. That's all. And look, I think that can be, that's great advice to apply to people going into the divorce as well, I'm assuming, um, from a client perspective, because you don't need to attach yourself to the theatrics or the drama if you just come back to what the law says um, and, you know, where what matters might influence the outcomes. Um, at the end of the day, nobody really wants to drag um, a fight out, not consciously anyway, um, but people do because they get caught up in the raw emotion of it. Is Has that been your experience where people just get so pent up and it, it's really hard to direct them through that? Oh, absolutely. And, and I don't blame people. I mean, it's their life. I mean, you know, it, their world is turned upside down. No wonder they're stressed. No wonder they're upset. I get that. And I also get the fact that they're coming in and I'm a complete stranger to some of these people and they are just unloading on me and telling me their world. And somehow I've got to shift through all of that to get to where I need to go because there's, a, there's probably a, there's probably 25% of stuff I really need to know. The 75% is all the emotional stuff that, that comes with it. Um, in saying that though, I also have in my career come across some practitioners who get caught up in the moment and, and whether or not it's because they're reliving maybe what they've gone through or they've, they're, they're um, taking on board their, their clients, you know, they're taking on board from a very personal point of view um, what their client needs rather than what, you know, what will happen on, on well-settled law, it, it does make it quite uh, difficult sometimes to move through the process when you've got so much chaos going on. You deal mainly with complex high net worth clients in your new practice. Why have you decided to focus on that particular area of law within your family law practice? I found, or I do find, that it's fascinating law. It's... Uh, it's really interesting. It's really interesting in relation to how, um, you know, corporations work and how that affects people and, you know, looking at things like taxation consequences and capital gains consequences. And, oh, I sound like an accountant, don't I, when they say they love numbers. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it really is interesting law and, um, and it, you know, it's a puzzle and I like puzzles. And so I like putting together the puzzle Uh and that's probably as simplistic as I can put it.
You were talking about before that you 25% of the information that comes from people is, is what you actually need to know. The rest is you just listening. It sounds like you wear a lot of hats as a family lawyer. And I, I can't say that every family lawyer would wear as many hats as you do. Do you think that's what makes you a great family lawyer is that you do have the ability to step into and, and have that empathetic, uh, empathetic vantage point? I think a, a good characteristic of a family lawyer is emotional intelligence. And if you've got that emotional intelligence where you can understand your client, understand their drivers and know where you need to go, then that... Um, that will be part of the the problem solving um, of the puzzle. So I uh, am pretty much dedicated to the idea of understanding my client, understanding a bit about them. So I, I let them tell me about them. You know, the the, the clock you know, turns off and I, and I, I want to know about them. I want to know where they come from. I want to know how they got to this position. I, because that, getting that level of information can really help you then work out who you're dealing with. And once you know who you're dealing with, then you can, can, can formulate what to do next. Absolutely. I mean, we talk, we've talked before about this holistic approach to um, law and in particular family law. And we do have to consider the whole person, how they are mentally, emotionally, physically. Um, I know we've talked about substance abuse and the role that plays in people's life and the consequences as far as the family law courts see that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. People are whole humans. Um, you've clearly got by nature a very kind and empathetic um, streak to you. You were actually a child lawyer for many years. Can you tell us a little bit more about that experience for yourself? Yes. So, um, and I'm not sure if people uh, know what that is, but but the court can appoint what we call an independent children's lawyer for children who are in proceedings where their parents are fighting over them. So what they do is they say, all right, we're going to allocate a lawyer to specifically look after the rights of these little children through this process. And so as an independent children's lawyer, your job and your mandate is to collate evidence, understand what's going on in the family dynamic and make recommendations about what that di- what, what should happen um, in this particular family dynamic. Now, we're assisted and we're assisted very ably by social workers, um, psychologists, sometimes psychiatrists, in order to formulate a position that... Um, we can then advise or, or provide to the judge so the judge can give that some consideration when looking at all the elements of what should happen in a, a what we call a child custody dispute. So it's very rewarding work um, to the extent that you, the, the court relies on you to bring an independence to uh, to what to what is happening in the family dynamic. And so um, once you get to the stage where you've got all that information, then it really is a matter for the judge then to determine how they apply. I can imagine, as well as it being rewarding, it's also very tough. I can imagine you saw and heard some pretty terrible things. Has there ever been a moment in your career where you've come across a a matter where it nearly broke you, where you just thought, I can't keep going in this field? Not to that extent, but yes, gosh, I've seen some sad things. Mm. And some, some sad things that people do to children, which is just, you know, some, some of it can be gobsmacking. And there was one particular incident that really I th- really was shocking. And, and what was very fortunate about that is the Department of Child Services swept in and could see the issues. And I was appointed this child's um, lawyer and we worked through those processes and we we put that child um, into a situation where she was no longer in harm's way but that was that was a really really difficult matter for me. With these cases you're seeing some of the worst of human behaviour how have you actually kept going after all of these years like why do you keep practicing family law? It's purpose you know everyone needs purpose and and I I enjoy the challenge and I enjoy helping people. And I really like the back end of it where I can see people um, come out of their family law settlement or their, their family law matters and they've got a result and they can get on with their lives. And I know that I've played a, a, a small part in that. And that gives me a sense of, um, really a sense of joy. How have you implemented that approach or that value into the way you practice with your new firm? 
this time around, it's been about um, being more focused about what the client wants, what the client needs, and how to get them there as quickly and as inexpensively as possible. That's the key to it. Um, And so the approach now about looking at how to deal holistically with a client is all those things you're talking about, you know, understanding their drivers, understanding where they're coming from, because that then gives me the key and and I guess the the pathway to to set their matter on a on a path that will get them to a resolution hopefully quickly. Not all lawyers have as much integrity and and no disrespect. I'm a former journalist, so you know I'm up there with used car salesmen um, in terms of how people view Welcome us. Welcome to my world. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So I and I actually used to be a real estate agent as well. Oh so, my you know. god, it's a, it's the perfect storm. <laughs> I, know. I know, I know, I don't want to do with any of it. But you know, there there are lawyers out there, and look, it's in every profession. I'm I'm not just picking on lawyers, but obviously in in this instance, that do the wrong thing and. You know, they've got a bad reputation and I think one of the f- biggest fears that people have in potentially even instigating a legal, um, like a separation or divorce process is because they're concerned about the cost. Mm. Um, you, you clearly take a different approach to law, but do you think in some instances some lawyers have earned that reputation um, for how they incite those problems and, and see dollar signs? Yes, so that's a very loaded question because there are many wa- many tracks I could go down. I am down. a journalist. Lisa. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think I think the problem is uh, with um, some lawyers is that there are many issues that they're dealing with in trying to get through the process and. Um, People who lawyers who just touch on family law, right, and they don't particularly specialise like I do. That's where I take the view that costs kind of escalate and and things can go a little bit off track because they're not particularly I favour with the process or or they're not really on top of the case law and understand what the courts are doing in relation to certain matters and that that's where I think things can go a little bit awry. Yeah, um, I think the important thing is when. It's like anything when people go to a doctor, they think, I'll go to any doctor because everyone's, you you know, you've all studied, you've all got a medical degree, so guess what? You should know exactly what's going on. But that we all know that's not the case. You know, the educated people around the world understand that there are there are some really well-tuned doctors and there are some doctors who are just floating around the edges, you know. So a bit like, in, of course, in, in a legal profession as well, there are some really well-tuned lawyers who understand what they're doing and there are ones that are just kind of tinkering with it. So um, my advice would be to clients, if you, uh, you know, if you really want to streamline your process and understand exactly what's going on, then go to a specialist because a specialist who does the work day in, day out will understand exactly what's going on. Yeah, yeah, and they live and breathe it. And That's I, exactly right. And I think from, from what's coming out in this series is that, you know, these people are very smart people, they're very worldly, and they still had no idea of what this process would involve so there was a bit of a shock factor um so you know a lot of people wouldn't even realize that specializing in family law is a thing you know if if you do property law surely you can do family law um and i think there is this education process and a steep learning curve that people experience when they first instigate this process um and look i'm not picking on lawyers i'm sorry uh there are rat bags in every profession but in every profession, there are also things that we could do better. What would you change or what would you improve or put more focus on improving in the field? So I think definitely communication between lawyers. I think that's essential. And I think streamlining the process in relation to things like discovery, handing over documentation in timely manner, um, you know, educating your client that you can't resist some of the things that you have to do and you have to hand over and be transparent about your financial circumstances. You know, I think they're the really important things that um, clients and uh, lawyers need to focus on because that, that, in my experience, that's what 
slows down the process, that whole swapping of documentation and getting valuations. And, and believe it or not, I mean, there is there is significant law about, you know, settled law about how you're required to get valuations and how they're required and how they come about. But it just, it just blows my mind that people are still prepared to argue about those sorts of things. And cor- I, I mean, I'm I see correspondence where people are still resisting, you know, the obvious and what the law says. And by the time you, you know, and unfortunately a situation where you, you either say, well, do you either accept it from me or will you ask a judge to make that decision, you know? It shouldn't get that far. It shouldn't get that far. Not in this day and age. So th- there's the expression, you don't know what you don't know. What advice would you give to someone who might be going through this process with a solicitor at the moment? Are there red flags that you say, watch out for these with how their their lawyers handling their matter? Yeah, I, I think that um, it's things like timely phone calls, um, emails being answered in a timely manner. And, and look, we all get busy. Uh, we all get busy. It, it, you know, it may take a couple of days for a response to come around, or it may take a, it may take two weeks. But as long as the lawyer advises the client that they've got a lot on their plate at the moment, they will get to their matter. But they, you know, their matter will be a priority. Um, I, I, I do think that also the um, not seeing the exchange of correspondence. I'm really surprised um, in this day and age too, where where some lawyers don't show their clients the correspondence that's being exchanged between law firms. I've I've seen that firsthand and I've that really surprises me as well that that's that happens um so I think they're the things that need to be that people should be wary of and you know if if something sounds not right go with your gut go and get a second opinion and look, you've been very vocal about interviewing and finding the right fit for you when when you are going out and finding a family lawyer. I know I did that process. I spoke to probably 12 family lawyers. Um, and one thing I was really cautious of is the advice that they were, without even knowing my matter, they were straight away going, oh, you've got a really good case for this. You could do this and you could do that. And I'm like, but that's not what I want. I was really clear knowing exactly what I wanted. I had it written out. And I think um, having that, from what I can tell from your advice, um, is having an end goal and being really sort of, dare I say, unemotional (laughs) as much as you can detach yourself um, and really listen to the guidance of your lawyer who's there to actually give you the, the parameters of what the law says. That's right. I mean, it, it certainly does help if, you, if, as a client, you you know where you want to go. Because if you know where you want to go, then that's half the battle. That's half the battle. So, you know, get educated. Know what the law is. Know what the law is in relation to your circumstances. Understand what it's going to cost you to get there. And and if you're smart about it, you'll you'll do it the most effective and cheapest way to get there. And, you know... It's, it's not unusual, but it's true that the more you fight in family law, the more it costs you. So it's the idea of just removing that level of toxicity and that argument and just concentrating on getting to your end goal. Oh, and look, it's not just the cost, it's the time. You know, time is something we can't get back. Money we can replace in, in theory, but it's the time and that, I guess, diversion of, of happiness that I think most people lose sight of. Actually, um, Ashley uh, point, pointed out, made a really good point. No one likes getting a law, a, a legal letter at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. No one, you know. So it's it's an ugly, it can be a very ugly process. And you heard him say that he, you know, his heart would flutter when he knew that something was coming in. And, and I get that. Yeah, it's that anxiety and and that name pops up in your email inbox and you go, oh. What is it now? now? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just the forewarning. And I think sending an email at five o'clock on a Friday is the lawyer's way of not, (laughs) of parking that conversation until Monday, um, which just induces stress. You know, that's so unnecessary um, and it's really not fair. So yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times those sorts of emails have come through on a Friday afternoon. Yet, uh, you know, and I'm talking to clients on Saturday morning, bringing them off the ceiling. You know, mm. what has being a family lawyer taught you about human relationships and humans in general? That they're complex beings, very complex beings. Um, as I said, I mean, you know, family law, seventy-five percent of it is emotional, and 
you know, we'll, uh, unless we find a cure for that, unless there's some, um, you know, pharmaceutical company out there who can give us all a shot to make us completely unemotional, uh, then we'll always have um, the idea of family courts and uh, people trying to resolve matters as best they can. Um, you know, we've talked about people always wanting, you know, there, there are element, there is an element out there that people want to get the win or, or feel as though they need to get the win. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've given the speech that it's not about that. No one ever wins, really. Because in some way, shape or form, this thing has costed you. And it's either costed you financially or emotionally. Um, it, it's, it's left an indelible ink on your children as they grow up. I mean, no one comes out of it scathed. Unscathed, I should say. No, and, you know, that whole parent guilt is, is, a, is a reality. Um, you know, you've got both sides. I don't think any parent... Most parents don't go into anything into intentionally wanting to hurt their children. Unfortunately, that is a byproduct of this very real situation because there is that a level of emotional immaturity, particularly when people are in these situations. How do you look after your mental health? Because holy moly, like I could not personally do what you do because I would get too emotionally entrenched. How do you manage it? It's taken some time. You know, as a young lawyer, as a young female practitioner, female practitioner, it, it it was very draining because um, you'd be taking on people's problems all the time, and it, it certainly would wear you down. And but as you grow older and you become more mature. You, you know, and, and, and you have a few more life lessons thrown at you. you, you tend to be able to compartmentalise what you are dealing with and you understand more about what your clients are dealing with. And um, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I certainly can pick up on people's, I guess, um, you know, issues and and that means I just immediately you know recommend experts in those fields for people to try and you know try and work their way through it but for me personally um, I think it really it's just about as you grow older you become more um, wiser. You're also a really big advocate on um uh, boundaries with how long you work and looking after yourself physically. What role does that play in your firm and how you are mentoring your young lawyers? Yeah, it's essential for young lawyers. I mean, we've all heard the war stories where you've got the the larger firms have young lawyers churning it out 70 hours a week and burning them out. I mean, um, and I've seen people, I've seen very, very good young lawyers walk away from legal careers because they have just been through that sausage factory, uh, which is really, really unfortunate. So um, for my uh, staff, I like them to have a life. Uh, we live on the Sunshine Coast, most beautiful place in Australia, um, if not the world, uh, you know, and so they should be enjoying it. And and I know that if I um, have my staff come in at 8.30 and they leave at 5 o'clock and they put in a good day's work and they don't work on weekends, that's quality. That's quality time between 8.30 and 5 I'm getting from from them and they're feeling it, you know. So they're, they're understanding that if they put in um, during those hours, that's all they have to do because it's not it, – it, it's not it, – it, it's counterproductive to be working at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. Do clients have the expectation, though, that you are available 24-7? And is that something that you have to educate and say, look, I actually am doing this to create a better outcome for my clients? Or are most people respectful of that? Look, um, uh, my clients are respectful of that. They understand. They're all busy people themselves. So uh, no one's expecting me to answer an email at 12 o'clock. That doesn't mean I don't get emails from clients and, and pract some practitioners. Even this week, I had an email from a practitioner at 12.58 a.m. I don't know what's going on there. But um, look, I think that, uh, I, I think that clients um, understand that, you know, you have a life, you're a person, you're a human. 
What are some of the ways that you remove the fight from matters when people are really amped up, they're raw, they're emotionally charged, particularly at the beginning? Um, what are some of the techniques you apply? So um, I've already mentioned about referring them away in relation to having a sounding board, maybe through a psychologist, uh, so they, they can express their anger and their all those emotions they are experiencing with that person so that when by the time they get to me, we can we can really, you know, nail down exactly where we need to go. Um, that That's... That's probably really, really important. And plus two, I mean, and I don't mean to lecture my clients, but sometimes I do need to come on a bit school mamish about we're not going to get through this unless you just calm down because you're no good to me if you are just ranting at me about what the injustices of the whole situation. I need my clients. And, and, and most family law practitioners would agree with me. We need our clients to be calm under you know because that's the only way that they resonate or they start to understand what's going on once they understand what's going on then that's half the battle interestingly in a recent bbc article um there was uh, i'll have to read the stat actually um the the title of the article is why women file for divorce more than men and it talks about when it comes to initiating a split there's a clear pattern in who makes the final call um and what it found in western heterosexual relationships women um uh, made up the uh, the highest proportion in the US specifically where no fault divorce um, is legal in all 50 states when we could probably come back to that um, that no fault statement um, some estimates put it as 70 percent of all divorces are initiated by a woman does that surprise you no, women seem to be uh, more organised and they also seem to be ready to move on, you know, a, a lot quicker. I, I certainly respect the fact that there are, there, there's a, some women who, um, you know, have been on the other end where um, they haven't instigated the separation and that, um, you know, they're coming to terms with having to deal with it and, and it's taken some time, but they're a small minority. That that stat doesn't shock me at all, particularly for what I've seen. Well, what it, what it actually goes on to say is that women who are college ed educated, that actually jumps up to 90%, which, you know, um, some of the social, I guess, key points of that, um, they talk about the women's liberation. So women are becoming more empowered to, I guess, make though they potentially don't need that marriage um, status, but they're also earning their own income. They're becoming more independent. Um, but interestingly, what they also talk about is women socially and emotionally are more ready. Um, they've got that level of, um, I guess, maturation um, and maturity of their counterparts or the, you know, the men. Do you see that... Um, as being a thing in separation that women are more emotionally prepared for a divorce? And if so, how do you help men, I guess, catch up? Do you know, I, I've got to put a caveat over this because it really depends on the circumstances of the breakdown. So, you know, and there are many reasons why people separate. Um, and I think I've got to be more generic about it and say that that it really some some people just check out of a marriage or a relationship, you know, six months prior to actually say or, or saying that the mar the relationship is now final. So it really depends on who checks out bef well before the actual um, you know communication happens about there's there's now going to be a separation because they're six months ahead. You know, they checked out six months ago, so they're ready to move on. And it's that person who's gone, wait a minute, I didn't see that coming. They're the ones who are lagging behind and they've got to try and catch up. They're the ones that really, really kind of struggle. But I'm not surprised about the, the stat in relation to educated women who want to just get it on and move on. I get that. I, in my experience, when I have um, represented um, women of that nature, that that's exactly what their attitude is because that's their go-to attitude, you know. Uh, it's like this whole um, concept that we've got at the moment where we're dealing with and we're interviewing um, these very, very uh, articulate and high profile people because they've all, they've, they all have a, t a personality type. And because of their personality types, that, in my view, I think that's what really influences how they get out of the back end. But I think the only disadvantage of their personality type is that they're used to controlling their environment. And that's the thing that they struggle with in this process is that they really can't control what is happening to them. Yeah. 
And what advice do you give when that type A personality is wanting to control and you have to sort of get them to take a step back? How? What's your advice in those situations? Just just educating them and just telling them that, that you, you don't get to make the decisions now about how this... You, you may have in your family dynamic, you may have been the, the, the leader or the person who was always the go-to who made all the decisions in the relationship and, you know, your, your ex-partner may have been the one who always deferred to you about how you're going to do things and make those types of decisions. That is is no longer existing. Um, he or she now has other influences in her life that are assisting her in making those decisions. And believe it or not, you're the last person that he or she are going to want to listen to in that process. And that is a shock to some people, you know. Um, and, and, but eventually they get it and they understand it. And, you know, I've had clients say, wow, you know, you told me that six months ago and I never believed it, but but I, I understand now that I was the last person that they were ever going to listen to. So it was no good me phoning up and saying, hey, let's just do a deal and let's just do this or let's just try and sort this thing out. It was never going to work. I mean, th- that's really pragmatic advice. What, what other tips do you have, I guess, to prepare people from that pragmatic perspective Going into a divorce, what are some of the things that people should be keeping in mind and preparing? Mm. Understand your financial matters. I'm consistently surprised how people defer what happens in a relationship to one partner to deal with all the financial matters. And there could be numerous reasons for that. You know, for instance, someone's too busy, you know, looking after the children and so they they kind of, you know, diversify and work out, well, I'll look after the children, you you look after the finances, but it just... I think that's very dangerous territory and it's important that everyone understands what is happening in their financial structures in their relationship because you not only have a romantic relationship, believe it or not, you've got a business relationship. Yep, and particularly if there is old money, generational wealth on one side or both sides, um, people coming into the relationship. I think one of the the biggest myths is that in divorce it's 50-50. Um, and like you say, it's a, it, marriage literally is a contract um, and perhaps people need to look at this contract in a little bit more of a professional manner. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, I guess that is a obvious point to bring in binding financial agreements. Nobody goes into a relationship and marriage thinking it's going to end. But do you think more people should be a little bit more prepared th- and look at binding financial agreements to protect themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that it, what it does is it clears the air. And I think people going into second, third relationships um, certainly uh, need to be very careful about what happens, particularly because if they have children to a, to a first relationship, then they need to protect that level of wealth for their children um, and for themselves because... It's not much fun continuing diluting your asset pool as you go through relationships through life. And just to put that in context, I guess most people would know know a BFA by the American term prenup. Mm. What are some of the parameters of how a BFA works? Um, Is it a matter of, you know, setting out how much a person will get if a split happens? Because I can assume that if you haven't got wealth and that wealth grows, what are some of the the key parameters of how a BFA works? So a binding financial agreement contains uh, a level of information about the party's um, current financial circumstances. Uh, It may contain um, detail about um, how they wish um, the assets they acquire through the relationship to be dealt with um, in the event there's a separation. Um, It certainly um, has information in there about what will happen with the asset base upon separation. Um, It may also include some, um, there may be a payment structure, so where one is more um, well, uh, one is more financial than the other party, there may be a provision in there about what financial structure is in place if there are certain um, timeframes in relation to a separation. So it can cover off on all those factors. Bearing in mind, though, they're not the golden solution because they can be contested. Um, it really is a matter of, um, about very carefully putting together these documents uh, and getting some solid family law advice about the documents. So you've got to be very, very careful about the way in which they're constructed and the way in which um, and the advice and listen to the advice you are given about the binding financial agreement because there's. Um, 
certain issues that you need to be alive to. You can't just sign it off and throw it in a drawer and say, I'm okay. You need to be alive to um, certain factors which may change in your relationship, like, for instance, earning capacity, um, injury, uh, those sorts of things, So, which may cause you to have to uh, keep revisiting that agreement from time to time. Look, and that's that's life, isn't it? Things change, things happen that we cannot be prepared for. So I think it's a matter of applying that pragmatic mindset to, to all areas of life, your wills, estates, all of those sorts of things. And I don't think people love talking about, you know, what will happen in these icky situations, but avoiding it doesn't make it any better. No, no. And I, and I look, if I'd have died for every time someone said to me, oh, but I never thought this would happen, um, you know, I just think that, you know, people need to be a bit more savvy about how they go into these relationships, uh, how they go into a relationship. And I think that that's particularly if they've got assets to protect. Would that be your number one bit of advice for people in a relationship? About having a BFA? (laughs) (laughs) Just, Just being, I guess, a realist. When you look at the statistics, I mean, the reality is the majority of people will go through this kind of relationship breakdown. And and as sad as that is, it's reality. Yeah. Look, I I think that um, it depends on what your starting point, what the starting point is. Um, If, for instance, you know, it's a young couple and and neither of them have assets and they're they're, they're starting out together on the same financial level, then... uh, no, I, I don't think they need to, to worry about a BFA. I think that's unrealistic. It really is about the, uh, the, the differential in financial um, arrangements. I think that's where people need to really look at protecting that. How do you broach that subject? Because when I was a little bit younger and more naive, um, a a boyfriend of mine suggested that he was going to get a prenup. And at that time, I had more money than him. Right. Um, But his family had So did you jump all over that? Did you? Oh, (laughs) he copped it. He copped it. Um, You know, he was... Anyway, we won't go down that. But, you know, he didn't approach it well, I don't think. And the reality of it was that I actually had more to protect. However, um, you know, being young and naive, in hindsight... Yeah, I would have got a BFA, not to protect him, but for to me. protect yourself, yeah. Um, and now when I get into another relationship, I will definitely be applying that. But do you think there, um, you know, people just have to have these conversations, particularly if they're in their second relationship or marriage earlier? Letitia, I think it's easier to have these conversations now because there is so much more information out there about the way in which um, people are separating and what's and the war stories about what's happened after people are separated. So I, I, I don't think people are as shocked anymore about the idea of having an agreement. So it's just an evolution thing. I think that time's passed and, and people now understand their value. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I think you've given a really awesome snapshot of how people can prepare um, themselves mentally, emotionally, as well as pragmatically. What are your hopes for this series and what people will get out of listening to it? So I'd like to think that people will be just a bit more educated about what happens during a process of a family law breakdown and take some tips away that might help them through the process. And I think the big thing is you know, what they're going through, they're not alone. Um, It doesn't matter what walk of life, uh, you know, where you come from, what you do, um, what stage of life you're in. um, You're all experiencing the same level of emotion and level of difficulty. But, you know, you'll eventually come through it as long as, you know, you you take on board the things that our people um, in this series are providing by way of, you know, tips. Yep. I look in the level of vulnerability that's being shared um, by these people who we're interviewing in this series is really beautiful. And hats off to you for allowing this opportunity for people to learn through others and people we respect in the community. So thank you very much for being the pillar of that and leading the charge in education around family law. Thank you, Letitia. Pleasure. Follow Toomey Family Law on LinkedIn, Facebook and YouTube for more practical family law support.